years, the whole Roman church was headquartered out of there, and the Roman church calls it the Babylonian captivity of the church, a takeoff on when Israel went into the Babylonian captivity for 70 years, and then they went back and rebuilt the temple now in the Old Testament. So we see all through this time, the popes and the bishops are fighting with local kings, local princes, and I mean literally they are fighting people over who's going to get the money here, who's going to have the authority, who's going to have the say-so. And uh, it, it just got uglier and uglier and uglier. In 1377, our second paragraph, Pope Gregory XI returned the papacy to Rome from Avignon, France. In 1378, the next year, the cardinals elected one pope for Rome and one for Avignon. All right? From 1378 to 1409, 31 years, there were two popes, each cursing and challenging the other. Now, you could imagine the authority of the pope is going down year by year by year by year by year. When God brings something down, he can bring it down in an hour, or a decade, or a century. He can do it any way he wants to do it. When Jesus came and was crucified by the Roman government in league with the Jewish authorities, in league with anybody in Jesus' group they could get to form an alliance with him, which would have been Judas, when all this happened, the you could sound the death knell for the Roman Empire. You could hear the bells ringing and ask not for whom the bell tolls. The bell tolls for thee, for the Roman Empire. It's just a matter of time until the whole thing collapsed. And so, God begins to pour out his spirit and corruption begins to collapse. Every year it's getting worse. Look at the second paragraph, 1409, the cardinals deposed the two popes and elected a new pope, Alexander V. But the two guys who had been in Avignon and Rome refused to step down, and for eight years there were three popes, not too cool. So the whole world looks at this and says, well, this guy says he can send us all to hell if he wants to. He has that kind of authority. And the other guy says, no, it's me, I have the authority. And then the other third guy says, well, I'm the one who's really got the authority. So our conclusion from 1050 to 1215, the papacy, the Roman Pope virtually ruled the world from its power base. But the confusion from 13 to 1417, 115 years of unbridled confusion, decimated the Pope's power and authority. Now by 1200, universities were springing up all across Europe. What were they teaching? Anyone? Theology. The only people that were educated were politicians and ministers, and most of the politicians started out as ministers and decided they could make more money doing it a different way. And so the only really educated people were the ministers. And before you had these monasteries and nunneries set up and they had a teaching center there for everything in their area. People would go over there and join this, you know, Benedictine or Augustinian or whatever order it was. Um, they would join up over there and get a whole bunch of teaching and learn languages and a little philosophy and all those kinds of things. So the more God poured out His Spirit, the more people want to know something. I think the Holy Spirit is pleased when we have an inquisitive mind. Unfortunately, most of the people that say, I have a really inquisitive mind, they never ask any questions. They're so self-centered, they assume they already know everything, and that's not an inquisitive mind. An inquisitive mind says, I'm working on this thing. I'm getting a hold of it. I've got a pretty good idea here, but I'm ready, willing, and able to let the Holy Spirit guide me through individuals, through the Scripture, through the Holy Spirit's leading. I want the Holy Spirit to guide me into more truth. Okay? So, 
By 1400, there were 75 universities in Europe, and most of them were brand new, at least, you know, a century old or something. Okay. Constantinople fell in 1453. That was the capital of the Eastern Church and the Eastern Empire. Uh, when the heathen took Constantinople, dozens of Greek scholars and philosophers and artists and everybody headed west because now they were being persecuted to the max. And every one of these developments, the more God poured out His Spirit, the more people went to universities, the more people wanted to be in the ministry, the more people were praying, trying to find a copy of the Bible in their, in their personal language, their vernacular that they could understand. And the weaker the Pope and the corrupt Babylonian system was collapsing. Okay? Notice about the fourth, fifth paragraph down in the Roman Catholic world heresy, which is degreeing, disagreeing with the official program of the Pope, was not only a sin, it was a crime. In 1252, the papal bull instructed the bishops that civil magistrates were to work with them in detecting and punishing heretics. In 1233, the Dominican order was given the job of heresy hunting. In 1262, the Pope set up the Inquisitor General at Rome to coordinate and spearhead this bloody task. Torture was the principal mean of, means of getting evidence. And what they did is they tortured you and killed you, and they divided all your assets three ways. All right? The bishop got a third. The secular authorities got a third, and they divided all your land, and everything that you had was gone. Now, that's a lot of incentive. And let's say that you're the bishop, and you're corrupt. And so-and-so has a lot of property and wealth. If you get your nephew to drop a dime, as they say, and report him to the authorities, and they bring him in, <coughs> torture him, and execute him, you get a third of his estate. And if his estate was $3 million, and you're the bishop, guess what? We can figure out a way to kill this guy. I get a million bucks. Well, you can see the problem with that system. Why did he have took that guy's spill? Him yeah, like King Ahab took the guy's field in the Old Testament, remember that? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful field, been in a family for years, and the king wanted it. And so he could have simply bought the field and said, this is a fair price, it's my field. But he decided to kill him instead. So, not too good. So, um, the bad news is, as the Reformation began to spread, and as this pre-Reformation took hold, and as there were new people coming up, and they didn't want anything to do with the Roman Church, uh, punishment, persecution began to be multiplied, and it was all over the place. God spared England and Scotland and Ireland for most of that, but it was a pretty nasty situation. Okay, you'll notice at the end of page 21, the Auto de Fe was a festival where heretics were burned at the stake. Not only was the bishop getting rich, the city was getting rich, the priest who was over the church where that person was a member was getting rich, um, but they were actually enjoying the torture. And so, they would have a huge party. Just like, oh, we're going to have a bonfire and roast weenies and sell cupcakes and we're going to raise a lot of money and it's just going to be a great event. Everybody bring your own bottle of wine. Woo! We're just having a big party. Well, what they were doing, their version of that is let's get some people that we think their doctrine is not right, line them up, we're going to torch, put them on stakes, put any books uh, or things that we can find with them around them, throw a little wood on there, we're going to burn them all simultaneously and drink wine and beer and 
party around the, the burning poles, whatever. Alto de Fe, a big festival of public party where we burn the heretics. There's something wrong when you really, with all your heart, want to kill and would totally enjoy the torture and murder of someone you didn't like. There's something wrong with that mentality as a Christian. I mean, we ought to be highly suspicious of that. Uh, it's not very good motivation, and it's hard to blame that on the Holy Spirit. Of course, they called it the Holy Inquisition, that the Holy Spirit had led them to this, <clears throat> but no one in their sane mind would believe that. Okay? Pre-Reformation, quickly, we're speeding up. Page 22. Pre-Reformation, William of Ockham, Franciscan monk who attacked the Pope for having too much power. He attacked papal and council infallibility. That's the big church councils. He was called the singular and invincible doctor. He was excommunicated by the church, John van Riesbeck, an influential mystic writer and teacher in the Netherlands. His brethren in the common life formed several schools in Germany and Netherlands and Erasmus and Luther attended these schools. John Wycliffe, also called the Evangelical Doctor, uh, and let me say this, up until about 300 years ago, no mere physician could have ever been called doctor. Only ministers were called doctor. And it was a term of great honor. It didn't mean they ever even went to school, but it meant they were brilliant, a powerful speaker, very knowledgeable in the scripture, and they usually gave them a nickname to go with it, the obedient doctor, the angelic doctor, the golden-throated orator doctor, uh, whatever. It was a big deal to have all the people call you the invincible doctor, meaning if you got an argument with someone, you never lost. Totally invincible. Such a knowledge of the scriptures, so much anointing. When they told you the way it was, you just went, oh crap, I must be wrong, and you just shriveled <laughs> up and walked away. So that's the way.